I want to thank everybody for showing up and support. Today is December the 4th. I hope everybody had a nice uh, holiday, uh, Miss Day, Thanksgiving's Day, whatever you want to call it. Uh, hope you had a nice holiday. My name is Brother Ray Ray. Welcome to the Dr. William Mackey Jr.'s lecture series, also known as African Helping Africans. We meet here every Wednesday in honor of every other Wednesday. Every other Wednesday, I'm sorry. Thank you, Brother, Brother Brown. Uh, in honor of Dr. William Mackey Jr., also Dr. Professor Amos Wilson, also Louis Reyes Rivera. <laughs> William Mackey, Gil Noble, and all the historians who gave up fame and fortune, big Cadillacs, lovely steak dinners, big houses, and all the festivities that America would provide a historian. They have gave it up. And the majority of them have died, left us, broke, with no money, because they made a decision to go to the truth. And that's one of the most important things that America is afraid of, the truth. They cannot handle the truth. America's think tank studies 365 days a year. <coughs> seven days a week, 24 hours a day, to keep this America going. The country was formed through murder, killing, and distortion of history. That's why we meet, because these people, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Ivan Van Surdy, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, and a host of other historians, you can name yourself, that gave up a good life. Now, over here, we have what I call the Amos Collection, in honor of Dr. Professor Amos Wilson, who used to sit in his office on 138th Street. And I just talked for hours and hours and hours. Blessing of survival. We have blueprint for black power. Moral, political, and economic imperative for the 21st century. Classic. A lot of pages. The developmental psychology of the black child. Everybody got something to say about our children. They can't do this right. They can't do that right. There's something wrong with them. Oh, Ritalin, you name it. Autism, you name it. Awakening the natural genius of black children. African-centered consciousness versus the new world order, which is not the new world order. The first new world order was the taking of America. Because every European that came over here said, I'm going to where? The new world. Mm -hmm. Issues of manhood in black and white, an inclusive look into the masculinity and the social definition of the African man. And Amos's classic, Black on Black Violence, Psychodynamics of Self, Black Humiliation in Service of White Domination. Everybody got something to say on about Black on Black Violence, mm -hmm. on why we kill each other. That is one of the first things that when you get into a conversation, now we can talk sports. Mm -hmm. oh, we talk sports in these gyms. We talk sports in the lunch rooms, mm -hmm. but when you get to talking about the system and how it operates, the subject changes. Well, what about black on black? What about what we do to each other? Right. Go to China. <laughs> Chinese will slice you up in a minute and put you in a walk with some rocks. <laughs> Go to Germany. They kill each other. Go to Europe. They kill each other. Go to Sicily. 
Not too long ago, I read an article about the Sicilian Mafia in Sicily trying to get territory and money. Just shot up about 15, 16 of rivals. And then this brother, Lee Ponda, he's not no longer with us. He passed away and Sababa finished, and he left all these books with Sababa. So I bought a couple of them. Revealing the unspeakable Bible verses, the truth about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the Holy Trinity. And I figured I'd get it out. And I had talked to Louis Ray Rivera's wife. I'm going to bring these. You know. So the stuff is here. I also have the tapes from last uh, former lectures that was done here. Dr. Arthur Lewis did excellent. Mike Graves has been here. The men's and the women's bathrooms to the left. We have refreshments. We're going to, I'm going to bring the speaker on. The speaker is going to speak from 8 o'clock, and he's going to bring it along to about 10 minutes after 9, 5 after 9, give or take. Then we're going to have pass the basket. Of course, we have refreshments, coffee, whatever you want. We have some soup, some some coming in and have something to eat, conversate, any books or anything. Then we're going to come back. We're going to have questions and answers. Anything you want to ask the speaker, he can answer. Then we're going to bring it on to maybe 10 minutes after 10, unless our good brother Danny over here wants to give, allow us a few more minutes. You know, if he says it's cool, it's cool. You know? Because we just visitors here, you know. Now, on Tuesday, every Tuesday at five o'clock, on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, www.manhattanneighborhoodnetwork.org, at five o'clock we have a program called Community Cop, founded by Mike Graves, Noel Leader, Julian Harper. While the lawn focus and this program comes on from five to six, and they tell you what's going on and different things throughout the city, and you can come, you can call up at five thirty, and anything you want to ask them, we'll ask them. Also, on Saturdays, while everybody is shaking and baking, moving and grooving, mm -hmm. and wheeling and dealing. We have Sister Empress Chi on Blog Talk Radio. You can call in, she's out of Philadelphia. And that's a program they roll until sometime 10.30 to maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Sister Tawana out of Baltimore will give you the lowdown on what's going on down in Bimor. Sister Empress Chi will tell you everything that's going on in, in uh, Philadelphia. So it's excellent. And you can call in and you'll be in the queue. Also, Brother Trust out of Newark has a Friday group that's phenomenal. And this brother's so humble, we leave Friday, and then he goes from Newark all the way out to Asbury Park on Saturday. Unbelievable. So we're trying to make our way out there and give him some support. But without further ado, we're going to have the topic for today is from Martin. To Malcolm. Mm. We're going to bring you one of the co founders members of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement. Very good brother. And we're going to bring on Brother Mike Graves. Give him a hand. Thank you, Brother Ray Ray. Say I am. I am. I am. Because we are. Because we are. Certainly, I'm um, just waiting for the day that Brother Ray Ray says my name right. <laughs> he says it like it has a B, like I'm in the grave, but it's okay. Sooner or later, he don't realize it has a Y in it. So Mike Ray Ray. Is. Mike Ray, is. all right. <laughs> the, um, uh, it's good to be out here tonight because anytime you see people come out, and weather that's beginning to become um, inclement, 
it's really good to see people. So good to see you, Brother Harold. You know, Thank you, man. Good to see everybody here. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, the person that recruited me into the House of the Lord Church many years ago is here, Minister Brown. Mm -hmm. Give him a hand. Good to see you. Good brother. Um, has the lar largest archive of activism yeah. in the world. Uh, yeah. I'm going to say that again. Y'all are going to get it this time. Yeah. He has the largest account of yeah. activism right. in the world. Right. God bless him. And then when you combine that with the lectures that he has, in other words, yeah. he's been in-house with some of the greatest scholars in the world yeah. and watch them do what they do. Right. But he's also been out on, on the front lines where people were um, taking it from the streets to the streets. Mm -hmm. He has more of that than anybody in the world. Right. And even if he's um, of late slowed down a little bit on that, it's going to take you a long time to catch up with him. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you're going to do it at all, I, I doubt it, because that level, level of activism is no longer here. Right, right. To that degree, and um, there are reasons for that. It's not black like men, you know, black folks who got how to be African, but yeah. it has more to do with um, yeah. the payoff, the buyouts of leaders. Yeah, the leadership keeping life. us from the activism that would be organically linked to the black mm -hmm. community is now, uh, they found out that the best way to deal with black folks is to deal with individuals yeah. who lead or, in most cases, mislead us. Yeah. And that's yeah. the situation that we're in now. Yeah. So many people that you know, names that you're very familiar with, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, might be misleading. That's right. And by misleading, it's not always decadent. If they're going to lead you into, into a dark alley, you're going to get killed. Not that kind of misleading. The kind where you know you want to do something, and you should do something, mm -hmm. but after they talk to you, you go home. Mm -hmm. You have a little say, a feel-good kind of pet rally, and then you go home. It's, it's not an accident that when... Uh, you see things jump off in various cities across the country mm -hmm. um, that they say, where is this person at? We need this person yeah, at. Yeah. You're supposed to look at yourself first right. and say, what am I going to do? And then you should look at your neighbors and your surrounding community and wonder what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Because it's of such great importance that something has to be done. Absolutely. Why would you first look to somebody that's halfway across the country and say, for example, we need Reverend Sharpton down here? Yeah. Okay. Wait, you mean you have yeah. 20 churches, no. 20, 30 churches within walking distance, mm -hmm. and you calling for someone to come from New York City, and you all way in Alabama? That's a problem. I mean, we fell into a trap that they put us, and I'm going to express that. I'm going to show you some examples of that uh, in this lecture because it's, it, it is, as um, Ray said, it's going to be about from Martin to Malcolm. Mm -hmm. Which way do we go from here? Because I want us to at least have a, um, an idea and perhaps a mindset on some things that we should do. And if we find out that we're not doing that, then we need to change. Um, New York City is a place where you saw some of the greatest activism many years ago. Oh, yeah. Now you literally see nothing. Yeah. yeah. Nope. What happened? Exactly. How did this happen? And why do we now have to more than ever do something about it? Now, you see people that have been killed in their own house. Yes. We got a grandmother in Atlanta, Georgia, where a so-called mistake happens, yeah. and a hundred rounds are shot mm -hmm. into her apartment, killing her because she was an alleged drug dealer. The woman wasn't selling no drugs out mm -hmm. of the house, and then it was characterized as a mistake. 
to yeah. have to pay. But suppose it was a drug dealer in there. Mm -hmm. How humane would that have been had they killed him, even if he was selling drugs? Selling drugs is not a death sentence. Why folks sell drugs all the time? You know? Even to this day. So that's improper uh, response to um, a criminal act. Now, our white people shot up, they sell more drugs than all the time. Anybody. They use more drugs than that's anybody. right. But they but they don't receive the things we receive. Yeah. Stop. Ladies and gentlemen. This problem. Mm -hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, that's part no, of yeah, but the African when, thing, when they call and response. Is that right, Minister Brown? Mm -hmm. Call and response is African? Yeah. No, so oh, y'all can say whatever y'all want to say. It, it, it don't it's not gonna affect me at all. Matter of fact, it might affect me if, if nobody says nothing. Because <laughs> I'm going to get suspicious. I'm <laughs> say, wait, wait, wait. Something's going on here, you know. Yeah. When, once I hear somebody say, get out of my pocket, you know, I'm going to I'm glad everybody here is familiar with that. <laughs> get out of my pocket. <laughs> and by the time the speaker, which was Malcolm, said, you know, relax, cool it, yeah. relax. You know, the plan was already in effect, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it's it's okay, you know, you know, call and response is good. Now I want to um from the outset, I always when I do a lecture, I ask a couple of questions just to get your mind to work and get you where you need to be. Um so um just ask, just quick, what what is um byproduct real quick? What's byproduct when you say Oh, well, that's just a byproduct. What does that mean? Anybody just want to volunteer? By What's a byproduct when you say, uh, well, that's a byproduct? Yes, sir. After, after the product comes, is the result of the product. Okay. Well, well, I, I was going to say something like what you said. Uh, say all, it. Uh, all say shoot, it. All shoot of the product. All shoot. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's an offshoot of something. Go ahead. What's left over? What's left over? Residual right. effect. Residual, Residual effect. Result. What? Some. A sum. Something plus something in the sum. So you say saying the sum. It's a sum of two things. It's the adverse right. effect to the and product. And then there's a third thing. Right. It's the okay. adverse effect to okay. the product. Okay. Just, just the only thing I was looking for is that I just wanted somebody to say as an add-on mm -hmm. that it uh, might be unintentional. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that a byproduct is something that's happening as a result of, as all of you really pointed out, mm -hmm. of something going on, there's a, there's a, um, a byproduct, something that happens, mm -hmm. but that result might be unintentional. Oh, okay. You know, that's just the only thing that I was looking for with it. Now, just one other thing. What's original intent? When someone says that's original intent, what does that mean? That's the primary What does he mean? Hold on, hold on, brother. Go ahead. The primary intent to uh, carry something else? Yes, it is, but there's a little more to it. But you have what to does right. he mean? I mean this, and I mean that. The objective. I mean the objective. The objective. Okay. Oh, okay. It's all uh, when it goes astray from the original intent. Sound like it. Yeah. Well, all, all of you are right. The intent is the meaningful product. Okay. Now, just one other thing. When someone says. Uh, that's not original intent mm -hmm. in a political or historical sense. Yeah. Now, what are they talking about? Right, they the say, what? Talking about the Constitution. 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 They talking about the Constitution. The founding fathers, that they call them. What's that? Adverse. The founding Adverse. Founding Adverse. Founding that's exactly it right there, what you just said, Harold. It's other than what the founding fathers intended. Right. If you go counter to that, they will tell you that's not original right. intent. Now, when you say something is counter to what the founding fathers, obviously, is no, nobody's father in Kenya. Yeah, no. So we ain't talking about the people. Well, founding generals are the ex-founding people. So we talk. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's something other whether they identify with us or somebody yeah. else. <laughs> but uh, original intent has to do with what they would suspect or what they would characterize the will of the founding fathers. Or the interpretation of what the founding fathers. They're going to inter it, it's interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if the so called founding fathers did not, in concrete, say something, exactly. uh, 
be interpreted in you. And you're absolutely right, and that's a key word. The interpretation of the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. Quick example of that. Black man gets on a plane, goes to England and has a rally with uh, the black folks there mm -hmm. to build unity. Mm -hmm. That is beyond the thinking mm -hmm. of the founding fathers. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That a black man here mm -hmm. can get on a plane, fly to England, organize, mm -hmm. fly to the Caribbean, organize, mm -hmm. and then go to Africa and uh, engage an organization to, you know, that level of Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. um, they can not even fathom that because they would wonder, what are the New York authorities even doing? Because they're supposed to check that right away. So when a person says that, uh, that's, that's, um, that's not original intent. They're saying that the founding fathers would never on any day of their life allow this to exist. So, um, just wanted you to know that. So, any, any quick questions on that? We understand original intent. It's not what the Constitution says. It's what the Founding Fathers meant. All right, we're clear on that. It's not what the Constitution says. Because we can argue the Constitution because it's written. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about something deeper. We're talking about interpretation. That's and I'm glad you used that that's word. That's why we got the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. And that's, and, 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 that's their job. And, that, and exactly, when all is said and done, when there's a constitutional issue, mm -hmm. or if it becomes a crisis, mm -hmm. the, uh, the most august body that's going to resolve that is the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. as, you saw, as you saw in 2000, when there was an electoral crisis, mm -hmm. right? right? Or as what happened in 1876, when there was a major electoral crisis, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court had to step in yeah, with yeah. Joe Bradley as a chief um, um, jurist on that to handle who was going to be president. Who were the two individuals that were going to be president? Uh, was right New York. Um, Come on, man. Oh, my God, a big Jesus Christ. Was it Andrew Jackson? Jackson. No, not no. Jackson. No. no, it was... Um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Ruth would be Hayes, and the New York boy. Well, you should know New York, Samuel J. Tilton. Tilton, right? Tilton Hayes, right there. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'll be, out of that came the Tilton Hayes compromise. Yeah. But it was decided by the Supreme Court, not American people. You know, not the not the Congress, not the House of Representatives, not the U.S. Senate. It was handled by the Supreme mm -hmm. Court, and it, and Joseph Bradley had fifteen had fifteen people, was a fifteen man, seven Republicans, seven Democrats, and he was the deciding vote. And um, and if you think Taney was something, you should look at the history of Bradley, the way he just disemboweled whatever rights we had mm -hmm. in the 14th, 15th, and the 13th amendments. Mm -hmm. He just literally destroyed them and made beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were never citizens with the intent, mm -hmm. the original intent of the Founding Fathers mm -hmm. was for us to never be citizens. Right. And he single-handedly uh, made sure that, and, they, and to this day, he's well respected in legal circles. He's mm -hmm. one of the greatest chief justices in their opinion that they've ever produced, him as well as Taney. But most of you are more familiar with Taney because of that dictum. What's a dictum, real quick? What's a dictum? Black man has no rights. So no, that's what he said. But what is a dictum? Hmm. It was the federal. It's a, it's a, it's no, a, what is it? It's an order by somebody that's not federally or legally established. Well, you, he's kind of close. With yeah, that. Yeah. It's a pronouncement based on. Unnecessary judgment. Okay? It's a pronouncement that you're going to dictate something, mm -hmm. but it's not founded on sound judgment. Yeah. So when, when Taney was um, making sure that um, Dred Scott um, was not going to be free and making sure that Dred Scott 
was not considered even a citizen of the United States. And, and the Supreme Court was brought in because of the diversity of jurisdiction. Uh, you have New York and you have Missouri, two states. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a, a question, when there's a fight among states, that's when um, the Supreme Court can come in and rule. Because when Missouri ruled, Dred Scott was free. Right. Because he was on free soil. And they had a saying, once free, forever free. So that's why uh, Dred Scott became a part of um, American history, really, because that diversity of jurisdiction brought in the Supreme Court, and Justice Taney now had what he needed to just destroy that and make sure. And so, after all the legalese, is what you said, Mr. Brown. He said, uh, uh, you know, a Negro cover, a black person has no rights that any white man is bound to respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where that came from, because he wanted to make the most uneducated white person that can't read or write understand clearly, I don't care if you're talking to a black person, whatever his station in life is, mm -hmm. you don't have to respect anything that he says to you. Still good law. And it's still law to this very day. Oh, okay. yeah. And that's tainted. Mm -hmm. And that was backed up by Bradley. And then... Uh, with all the um, uh, amendments that you see to this very day, uh, they have still been able to um, destabilize those amendments, as you saw several years ago, it started in Alabama mm -hmm. with the Civil Rights Act. Uh, they basically, of uh, 64, they destroyed that act, so now they have control of their own elections again, and you literally have no say whether they, um, whether you can vote or not, uh, because they destroyed and uh, were able to rationalize in front of the Supreme Court that um, that they don't need uh, civil rights safeguards anymore, and that even in places like New York State, where um, where you have um, uh, segregated voting laws, the same way as you did Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia places like that. That's why New York was a part of the civil rights legislation. So um, you had a situation where uh, now with the diminution of these laws, I wouldn't say we're back to square one, but I'm just saying that the, um, those who don't want to see us vote, they have the artillery in their back pocket to keep us from voting mm -hmm. until those uh, uh, safety safeguards are uh, restored, but um, in any event, want to talk about Malcolm. Want to talk about Ma Ma Martin, and um, want to philosophically go down the corridors of time and ask which way should we go? Because um, we have to decide. What are we going to do? Um, because too many of us are dying. Right. If you don't know, then, then you've been sleeping like Rip Van Winkle. And you've missed 20 years or more of your life. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand, you know, just the dangers involved in what's going on as we speak all over the country. Now, I'm not even talking about New York, Chicago, places like that where you've seen egregious shootings. Texas, obviously. Georgia, but in small little places like Baltimore, would you see what happened in Ferguson? Small little 20,000 people, 21,000 people mm -hmm. live there. You see these acts, you know that there has to be a decision. One of the greatest decisions you will ever make in your life is the decision to fight. And what will be the accoutrements you're going to utilize in that fight? That's going to be one of the hardest decisions you will ever make, mm -hmm. is fighting and standing up, maybe for, perhaps for someone that you don't even know. That's going to be hard, very hard, to come to. We're going to, we're going to hold a question that I'm going to try to get through. That's going to be one of the hardest decisions you'll ever make. So let's talk about Martin. Martin Luther King, born, I'll give you some boring facts and but we're going to move quickly. Really but boring. He um, was born in Atlanta, Georgia, 
1929. Uh, his name was, when he was born, was what? Michael. Michael. Uh, when was it changed? When the father was born. Okay, his father did go to Germany in 31. He was born in 29. Yeah. A group of the Baptist something World Alliance, I'll give you the name. Uh, they went to Germany, uh, the Baptist World Alliance, he yeah, okay, was right, the Baptist World Alliance. He went there in, in 1931, and his father's name was Michael. Yeah, okay. And senior, obviously, yeah. and he was junior. He was the middle child, he had an older sister and a younger brother, you know, a young brother we all familiar with, A.D. A.D. King. Uh, but having gone to that conference, in Germany, uh, the, the person who spearheaded him going over there sort of recommended it that he should change his name and change his son's name to Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. So he went from Michael King to Martin Luther King at two years old. It was changed. Now later, uh, Daddy King, as he's called, Daddy King said that um, it was oversight by the attending physician. Mm -hmm. But that, that's not even possible. Mm -hmm. Because if it was an oversight, you mean they did, they did the oversight twice? Yeah. His right. father? Yeah. Uh, made a mistake. It was a mistake with his father's name? Yeah. And then it was a mistake with his son's name? Yeah. That's impossible. So it was obviously influenced. And, and, and nobody wants to admit that they were influenced by a white man on a white trip to Germany. And this was done during the early years where the philosophy of Nazism was being developed. Yes. You know, so um, in that climate, this religious group went there, and um, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm hesitant to believe that this was um, an epiphany of sorts. You know, that somehow God was involved in that. But you, you know, said turning to say that. It had to be epiphany. You know, turning But in any event. He changed his name to Martin Luther, which is, as you know, the person who attributed, you know, that thesis and, you know, a reform within uh, what was going on in the Catholic Church. Ergo, it changed in the Baptist, but not sort of the Protestant Church mm -hmm. came out of that, out of what um, Martin, Luther's, uh, Martin Luther's actions uh, with the Reformation. So. Um, so his name was changed from Michael to Martin Luther King. And um, he grew up a prince of sorts, middle class family, mm -hmm. uh, come from two generations at least of preachers. His grandfather was a preacher. Mm -hmm. His father, Daddy King, you know, he was a preacher. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King was a gifted child, very sort of disobedient, you know, would go against and defy his father, which he did several times. This was capsulized at 12 when he was, he wanted to go to a parade and his father told him no. He snuck out of the house and went to that parade anyway. And um, when he came back, he got the bad news that his grandmother died. Uh, now, I sh should mention that he dealt with bouts of depression, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all his life, Dr. King. He always felt less than inadequate for all the positions that he uh, ended up taking. But in this particular instance, you know, he was so depressed about his grandmother dying that he blamed it on himself. And um, he tried to commit suicide because he thought that somehow this was a backlash blowback from him disobeying his father. Mm -hmm. So he jumped out of the second floor window and almost died. Mm -hmm. But he survived that, um, obviously, and uh, went on. And, and by the time he was like, 15, <coughs> he'd already graduated from school. He was already in Morehouse at 15, uh, graduated in four years, and um, went to Crozer which is right here, not far from Pennsylvania, Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. Now, while there, um, 
he met, you know, future, some future um, people that would, would be great ministers in their own right. One we all know, and that's the great, the great William Augustus Jones. Oh, yeah. We met there. They were called the Sons of Calvary. Mm -hmm. um, because they all were there, and they were all, you could just see the greatness in them. I mean, is everybody familiar with William Augustus Jones? Oh, yeah. No. no. Okay. Well, just one of the greatest black men you ever want to meet. Um, and um, the other one was Samuel Proctor. Mm. You know, um, a legend also. Yeah. So the two of them, uh, the three of them, were all there at Crozer. So I will attribute their greatness to them themselves, not so much Crozer. But it was them. They were lights. And Anybody who's around them can see it. And um, I mean, if you saw William Augustus Jones, this is big, strong, light skinned black man yeah. that yeah. had a booming voice, yeah. a baritone voice, and um, so sharp. His mind was so sharp and um, had a particular way of preaching that um, you just got to respect that old school preaching, yeah. the old school preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister Brown had a little bit of that in him. <laughs> there was a demonstration. <laughs> but 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 William Augustus Jones was something else. Now Dr. King saw so I'm just saying they were they were on an equal level, you know, um, you know, any way you want to slice it. So in any event, from there he went to a course at you know to um, Boston University for his theological um, doctoral thesis. <coughs> You know, become a PhD, and, and, um, and it was in divinity. And um, but I guess I'm getting ahead of myself because I wanted to say that it was a little mishap that most people don't know, and that was at Crozier. Uh, he fell in love with a white girl. Oh, Dr. King. Yeah, and was this close to marrying her? Oh my God. Uh, but it was his friends. Mm -hmm. It was his friends that convinced them, don't do it. Uh -huh. Because they all said, look, look, man, you're going to be great. Uh -huh. Don't do this. Brother, you know, uh, you, you got the path. You on the path. You to where you go. In other words, their, um, what's the term? I guess I'll just say destiny. Yeah. It was destiny that put him there. And it was destiny that put the great William Augustus Jones and Samuel Proctor there. And, um, and they understood that. So he was advised. Now, I don't know if it was just them two or whether it was uh, several other friends, mm -hmm. but he, qu he met quite a few uh, preachers at that time, and they told him, don't do it. And they really had to convince him. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, I won't say too much about the white girl, but um, I'll just leave that part alone. But he almost married. I would just say that. I, I was just gonna. I was just gonna start telling you some stuff about her. But I'll leave that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about Dr. King and Malcolm. You know, I'm just mentioning that because if I mention Malcolm had a thing with white women, mm -hmm. then I got to be fair about it. Dr. Mm -hmm. King did too. Mm -hmm. But no way did they say Malcolm was gonna marry a white woman. Dr. King was set on marrying this white woman. So, mm -hmm. so in any event, we can move. You know, I, you know, because I, I know it's a couple of y'all in here that uh, did the same thing, but... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Some of y'all might be who been saying that. But anyway, uh, he was able to rebound from that, and of course, uh, when he got to Boston University, he met the love of his life. And we all know her because she was uh, great in her own right, Coretta Scott King, mm -hmm. who at that time wanted to be a singer. Uh, she was a great piano player and singer and all that stuff. And, and Daddy King had a problem with that because he said he wanted Malcolm, I mean, he wanted Martin to marry somebody like the wife that he married, dedicated to the church. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to be a performer. Mm -hmm. But you know, as fate would have it, that was the right person mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. That was the person. Mm -hmm. Because of all, I'd say of all the wives, and I think I'm going to say it ground, if I say of all the wives of <laughs> who were famous, nobody 
continue that legacy better than she did with right. one exception. Mm -hmm. And it's only one, and if you know another, you can hold it to the Q&A and tell me. The mm -hmm. only other one that I know, wife, was women. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's the only one I know mm -hmm. that was that strong about making sure that their husband's legacy stayed intact. Mm -hmm. Because when he was able to bring that name to America oh, yeah. and all over Africa, yeah. when uh, uh, Mandela went in a relative unknown. Right. Nobody knew anything about Nelson Mandela. It was his wife that made him famous. So like I said, I love the work of Coretta Scott King. I think her only equal is Winnie Mandela. I think Betty Sebastian You know, um, I don't know of any, and, and I'm not, uh, you know, putting any shade on any of the, uh, the so-called famous wives, but those two are uh, both outstanding uh, at continuing the legacy of their husbands. I think Betty Sebastian good. Um, we'll, we'll deal with that, but it's not true. It's, it's, it's just not true. Um, and, but, but bring it up though, when we do the Q&A, bring it up and just tell me what you got and we'll look at it. Now, um, Dr. King uh, went on from there to Montgomery. And I'm going to um, do juxtapose their philosophies in a minute. But of course, um, as you well know, I might have to move faster. Okay. As you well know, Dr. King from Atlanta uh, started his uh, ministry um, instead of instead of continuing in his father's legacy at Ebenezer, mm -hmm. he went to Montgomery mm -hmm. to start. And um, in Montgomery is where we became familiar with him because uh, shortly thereafter, while he was just finalizing his, his doctoral thesis, uh, it jumped off. You know what happened, Rosa Parks, and I won't get into. Uh, Robinson or Colvin, you know, Cordette Colvin, the other women, that the same thing happened with Rosa Parks. And there's, that's a whole other discussion on why did, did, why did people f chose to fight for Rosa Parks, but they didn't fight for those other sisters, mm -hmm. who the same thing happened to them, where they was physically removed from a bus. And why did people step forward for her as opposed to them? That's, We'll deal with that another time, but that's a discussion in itself. Well, well he, he said it, but I won't discuss it. But if you look at her and you look at the mother sisters, it's fairly obvious. You know, um, uh, Rosa Parks was a fox. Fine as May Wine. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Light skin. Yes, sir, buddy. Those other sisters uh, were fine, but they were dark skin. Yeah. So, unfortunately, and she was a card-carrying member of the NAACP, right, right. had some community work in it, so they, they rocked with her, you know, right. it's that simple. You know, we talk about at a time where you still had to pass that black bag test yeah. so. to get into certain universities, the black universities. You know, they put your face up against a black bag, brown and bag. if you was lighter, what's that? Brown bag. I mean, brown bag, what am I saying? <laughs> if you was darker, well, could you hear? I'm sorry. <laughs> Good looking out there. Brown bag test. Did I say black bag test? Yeah. Yep. Brown bag yeah. test. You remember the old shopping bags that was yeah. made out of paper? Yeah. Because yeah. most of the time now, it's, still up. it's a lot of plastic. But it's still something, you know. As a matter of fact, you probably got a brown bag right there. That's a brown bag. They used to have, that's where you used to shop, and they had bags like that. And even though the big shopping bags were a little bit darker than that. You you know that's that was the old test and that and it, yes even places like Morehouse and Howard and all of them yes they had that mm -hmm. test you know so um, that was during that time so when Minister Brown just let the cat out of the bag and said that it was light skin it's true you know that a lot of us would do something for a light skinned woman oh, yeah. that we wouldn't do for a dark skinned right. woman and that's yeah. that's just a sad commentary on us. But that's the way it yeah, was, and um, unfortunately, in some cases, it's still like that now. Black and berry, the sweetest juice. So you know, <laughs> well, that's a personal thing. You know, but, you know, it is what it is. 
So, so Dr. King came up through that experience, and um, when all was said and done, the ministers there met, you know, because it became an issue because it was Rosa Parks. And the NAACP had to be committed because she was um, a lifetime member and worked for the NAACP. So um, they created, because they didn't want the onus on them, and no individual minister wanted the onus on them. So they did a collective. And they voted for Dr. King mm -hmm. to be the spokesperson for the Montgomery Improvement Association. He should not have been the spokesperson because he just got there. Mm -hmm. You know, and he just became a pastor. Just got there. So how do you look at seasoned veterans that have been around for years? And now you have a Johnny come later now, he might have that tradition in his family going back to his grandparents, but he was new. But the, the ones who were there, they understood we got to live here. And they didn't want to mess around with the White Citizens Council. Right. That was the prevailing white supremacist group at that time in Mobile. Uh, we all familiar with the Klan, but in um, Mobile, Alabama, the top dogs were the um, White Citizens Council. And so they didn't want that smoke, so they elected this new guy, Martin Luther King Jr., that had a um, famous father from Atlanta, Georgia, because they knew if things got thick, they said, man, you could always leave. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't leave. We don't have nowhere to go, but you can always run back to dad. Mm -hmm. You know, and he just had a new wife, you know, and um, so, in any event, that's how he came to um, existence around, you know, that we were familiar with, the Montgomery Improvement Association. And they chose the boycott. They chose uh, what they looked at as the road to lease uh, resistance, which is just withhold your money and convince people to actually walk to work or to um, carpool. So, um, it was not a new idea, uh, as I m mentioned briefly uh, yesterday for a second, because um, uh, the greatest person that did that was Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if we want to look at history, right? Nobody did that better than Reverend, um, before he was even a congressman, he was already doing boycotts. He was doing boycotts in the 30s. So uh, the, the, the dawn, was Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And that was an example of how to withhold your money and get things done. So, and also, prior to the Montgomery bus boycott was Reverend Jemison in um, Louisiana. He did it a little less than a year before Dr. King. So Dr. King and him heard about uh, a boycott in um, Louisiana. And, um, decided to try that. And, um, and it worked. They were able to, they started in, in December, of, um, December 5th of 1955 and it lasted 57. It took 13 months to break the back of the bus company where you no longer had to sit in the back where you could basically sit anywhere you wanted to. Now, um, so that's where, that's just the history of Dr. King real quick. I'm going to do a quick history of Malcolm, and then uh, we'll get into the philosophical things and open it up for questions. Now, now uh, Malcolm, as you know, was born four years earlier than Dr. King. Dr. Mm -hmm. King was born in 29, Malcolm was born in 25. Where at? Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, right. Omaha, Nebraska. He was um, uh, a child of Garveyites. Mm -hmm. Mother and father, both Garveyites, very active in that organization, UNIA, very active. Uh, matter of fact, they wrote in the UIA paper. Uh, Malcolm's mother wrote articles. The father did recruiting and, and went all over the country, um, basically preaching, and would leave his family at times and go away for a long period of time preaching. 
Garveyism, mm -hmm. and we'll come back to the family. Well, his father was killed. Malcolm was six years old. Uh, family after that torn asunder. His family, his father was killed by the Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. as you, as we all know. If you even have seen the movie, uh, they they threatened him several times, and ultimately. They did um, what, you know, he paid the price for what he was doing. Um, and um, he was killed. Now, Malcolm, now I just painted a picture of a young prince. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. King grew up, uh, was privileged, worried for nothing. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, on the other hand, family torn asunder, all the kids in various um, foster care um, houses. Grew up that way, and um, mother put in the, in the same asylum. Yeah, that was much later, but that happened shortly after um, the father was killed, and she just couldn't handle all of those children running around the house. And obviously, she had to. Um, uh, she just caved in, as in, in that can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. So that's not a shortcoming on her part. That can happen to anybody. Stress is the sound of killer. It's invisible. Mm -hmm. And stress affects all of us different ways. Mm -hmm. She's no less than any of us in this room. Given the right conditions, we can forward. And um, she was having it bad. But, uh, and that's not to say that she was in bad enough condition where she deserved to be committed. Mm -hmm. They're saying that after the fact. So you can't look at her after she was there for a while and you don't know what drugs they was giving her mm -hmm. and say, oh yeah, yeah, something's wrong with her. Maybe nothing was wrong with her. She was just stressed, emotionally drained or from judged. trying to handle those children at that time and finances, trying to keep the house in order with all these threats constantly that they were going to take their children, which they did. Um, Malcolm was in school, and Malcolm was scholarly as a young man. Uh, was able to become class president in an all-white school, and um, I, I think we all know what happened to Malcolm in the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, when the teacher asked him what he wanted to be, uh -huh. and he said he wanted to be a lawyer. And the, the, the teacher, you know, and that's influence, you know, at that early mm -hmm. age. The teacher was able to say to Malcolm, you can't be to be realistic, said Malcolm, one thing you have to learn right away is have realistic goals. Mm -hmm. And said that you know you can't be a lawyer. Because mm -hmm. first of all, black people wouldn't even go to you mm -hmm. if they needed help for, from a lawyer. They're going to go to a white person. And he, and he said, certainly white people are not going to go to you as a lawyer. So he said, Michael, be more realistic and practical. Learn to do something with your hands. Have a realistic goal. Learn to do mm -hmm. something with your hands. So the movie, in the movie they say, you know, told him to be a carpenter because Jesus was a carpenter. You know, I don't know if that actually was the case, but basically uh, his growth was stunted because the teacher told him to be realistic and to be a lawyer was not realistic, and at that time, we did not have a lot of black lawyers. Right. Uh, Charles Hamilton Houston was already a lawyer by then, mm -hmm. and um, doing great things, but it was not well known, and it was years later that he developed a cadre of young lawyers, among them Thurgood Marshall and others, who eventually was able to overturn Jesse Pless mm -hmm. Pless versus Ferguson, you know, um, that that happened you say that that happened in '54, but um, we're talking about Malcolm in those early days. He didn't have those examples in front of him at, of a lawyer, and so on. Um, he gave up on that and um, went to a life of crime. He went to the streets, and um, the streets were more than happy to accommodate him. So here you have a prince on the one hand in that same era living um, and fulfilling all of his father's wishes uh, and doing well. And you had this other person uh, by that time, who, after going through the foster care system, and now he's in Detroit, 
uh, known as Detroit Red, so he went from Malcolm Little to <coughs> the streets of New England as Detroit Red. Detroit Red uh, involved himself in literally everything. It was easy. unsavory. <laughs> literally everything. He involved himself in gambling, numbers, um, drugs, even pimp black women. Mm. And pimp black women to white men. Mm -hmm. um, Malcolm called it steering because he basically said that the desire was there, but white men love black women. Yeah. So he basically said he was steering them. Oh, you want one? Okay, I got one for you. Mm -hmm. You can go over here and, you know, of course, told the sister you can make a few dollars. So was he an active pimp in the traditional sense? No, not really. In other words, he didn't have what pimps call a stable. Okay? He didn't have a stable, but he knew women that needed a few dollars, and he knew white men that wanted some black women. So he's a freelance bro. In a sense. <laughs> In a sense, but he's basically steering. He's a pimp. That's what he was doing. So, <laughs> we're talking about two different individuals. They're going to form different ways. Now, obviously, the conventional route was Dr. King. Uh, was able to fly through school, skip two grades <coughs> in ninth and the 11th. Uh, go, go into Morehouse at 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And at 19, already in theological seminary, mm -hmm. After three years there, and um, was able to, to uh, avoid marrying that white woman that he almost mm. married. Ergo, Boston University, where he met, let, met the love of his life. Malcolm, of course, came to Harlem, and his criminal activity just escalated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Malcolm ended up, after that thing with... Um, What's the number run? Um, no, but hold on. The, after the number run? Oh, oh uh, Bumpy, uh, um, not Bumpy, it Bumpy was, um, uh, his name will come back to me, Wesley and Archie. Mm -hmm. After dealing with Wesley and Archie, they got into that beef over a number that Malcolm claimed he won. Mm -hmm. And um, it's no, no question that Wesley and Archie was killed. Mm -hmm. But you know, he loved Malcolm, mm -hmm. but he was a cold blooded killer. Mm -hmm. And then he ain't gonna let nobody take no money from him. In. And it got ugly, and Malcolm had to leave town. Now, mm -hmm. both of them not mm -hmm. gonna exist in home. Mm -hmm. You know, Malcolm carried a gun, the gun that Wesley and Archie gave him, mm -hmm. and Wesley and Archie and his crew carried guns. Mm -hmm. And they, and neither of them was playing. Malcolm understood that he had to leave, because one of them was gonna die, and um, the odds are it was gonna be Malcolm, mm -hmm. not Wesley and Archie, because he had a crew. Mm -hmm. So he left and went to Boston, and that's when he got arrested. Doing the same stuff he was doing here, mm -hmm. he did it in Boston. He was arrested. Discipline, man. Discipline, trust me. It works. So what he did was, and hold it, don't forget the question, don't forget. So now he gets arrested in 46. Write it down. 46, six years. Six years, he's in jail. In that jail, Malcolm hates religion so much, what did they call him? <laughs> somebody said it. Satan. Satan. Was so against any time somebody talked about religion, Malcolm, with, with what little sense he had left, because Malcolm was crazy, um, would just rail out against him with the little information he had on religion, would just shoot down your position. Mm -hmm. Whatever you said about religion, Malcolm not. Uh, but then, uh, it was a, a guy in jail, I think his name was Bimby, and this person, this different person if, you, if you're going by the movie, mm -hmm. different person because they did a composite of three different people mm -hmm. when you saw in the movie that brought him to Islam mm -hmm. and to the nation of Islam. Uh, but, you know, the, that person was smart jail-wise and Malcolm admired him, and he, uh, when Malcolm approached him one day and he told Malcolm, why do you act so damn stupid when you're so smart? And Malcolm said, what? He told me, he said, look, I can see you're an intelligent guy. But Malcolm was trained by the streets. Everything to Malcolm was an angle. Mm -hmm. Everything was about how do I get over? Mm -hmm. So he will, anybody he around, he's going to try to get over and get slick on you. 
And the guy told him, why don't you use your, that brain you got for something useful and, and have some intent behind the things you do. Malcolm went to the dictionary and literally copied the entire dictionary, wrote down every word in the dictionary and studied it and was able to give it the definition. Of course, by then also you had at the same time his brother came to him and told him about Islam, but not in a traditional way. His brother told him, Malcolm, do you want to get out of jail? Now, when you say that to a criminal, all the criminal instincts, you know, light up. Like, yo, what's the scheme, man? How are we going to do this? He said, look, I got a way to get you out of here. And of course, Malcolm was all ears by then. He was like, yo, what's up? What, what, what do I got to do? He said, man, I got a way to get you out of here. And he said, um, you ever heard of um, Elijah Muhammad? Malcolm was like, no, but you know, how do I get out of here? And he said, well, look, man, you know, this man knows everything. And um, Malcolm said, well, nobody know everything because if you do everything, you would be God. And of course, you know, his family was able to tell him, look, well, you know, he met with God. And he talked with God and he walked with <laughs> and Malcolm, and Malcolm was like, well look, Malcolm was like, look, if this would get me out of here, just tell me what to do. <laughs> so without even giving him um, definitive instructions, you know what his brother told him? Don't eat pork. Mm -hmm. Gave him a simple one first. Just told him, don't eat pork. Mm -hmm. So now Malcolm, the next day when he's on the line to eat, Malcolm remembered the last second. And then when the guy was getting ready to put the pork chops on his plate, he said, yo, man, I don't eat pork. And Malcolm said, like, in no time, everybody's saying, what's up with Satan? <laughs> Satan don't eat pork. <laughs> he said he was amazed uh -huh. that he was able to say, no, I don't eat pork. So now, all them guys was amazed that he took a stand like that. He said, I don't eat pork. And when he saw that people were amazed at that stance, he, it even emboldened him more. He was strong and he wanted his brother to come back and give him some more. Yeah. So his brother slow walked because his brother knew, look, Malcolm been a criminal his whole life. Mm -hmm. You can't fat, you know, you can't get on a fat track. You got to give him little things in a scheme way. So he was telling them, scheming on how to get out of jail. So now Malcolm is studying that dictionary, writing everything down memorizing the definition of words. And that's what, that helped him later on, obviously when he went to Harvard and Oxford and them places, mm -hmm. because he was kicking professors' yeah, words. Because uh, a professor is gonna trick you with words, mm -hmm. gonna trick you with his knowledge of history. But if you study it, and study the, you know, the etymology of words, and understood history, which he started reading everything. He read everything that was in the library. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's why they don't have those kind of books in jails anymore. Mm -hmm. Because of Malcolm, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And now Malcolm mm -hmm. was in jail in 46. To this very day, they will never have in the library that level of history. Mm -hmm. To get that, your family would have to bring you the books. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the right family that's conscious, you can't teach what you don't know. So in any event, Malcolm was in jail from 46 to 52. Uh, came out, uh, I would say reformed. I have no problem saying Malcolm was reformed when he came out mm -hmm. and was looking forward to changing his life because he changed in jail. Because you can be a criminal and involve yourself in criminal activity in jail. Mm -hmm. Malcolm had really had reformed himself, and uh, by '52 he came out and became a me member of um, the Detroit Mosque. And in no time he was promoted. In no time to assistant minister mm -hmm. because he was always suggesting things. We got to do this. We got to do that. We can improve. We can get better by doing this. We got to start making flyers. We got to get a loudspeaker outside, you know, so what we hear, what we saying inside can go outside. So Malcolm was already fishing, going to barber shops, talking to people, you know, going with people, hang out where the crap game was and start talking about these things. And, some of the guys thought Malcolm was crazy. Like, you know, you know, Red, what you talking about? <laughs> you know, but, but he was serious about his business. So I'm showing you two different, I'm showing you two different Spectre. people. Mm -hmm. Two different perspectives. One was a prince, born a prince. Yeah. And 
would have eventually been the dean of a, of a black university or college president without the activism, mm -hmm. just based on scholarship. And the other one ultimately became our shining black prince. And, um, and maybe I should stop there. Maybe, uh, maybe I can talk about some of the philosophy to start. Go ahead. And, um, Go ahead. Ray, I'm good? Well, he, Go ahead. So, so anyway, so we have two different... We have two different people here. One, an ordained minister, Baptist minister, Baptist church, very connected. I'm good on time, Ray, or when, just tell me when. You know, I'm good? Ten, or should I stop? Ten minutes. Okay, go ten Five. minutes. You said go ten minutes? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. So now, you, so you have these two individuals. Dr. King just came off one of the greatest boycotts. I mean, for the South, we have to remember. Mm -hmm. See, this won't make sense if you don't understand the South. You know, uh, literally every white man felt he was above you oh, yeah. at that time. Yeah, really. And you could not, in any way, physical or, or just, just <laughs> visibly, from a distance, even look at him. Cross eyed or straight eyed, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't do it. Um, so at that time, to launch that boycott, which actually changed the dynamics of the entire South, so we're talking about the Confederacy, was able to change that uh, through what happened with Rosa Parks. They were able to organize. Black folks went for 13 months without riding a bus. Mm -hmm. That level, we to that point have never seen it. Yes, it did happen in Baton Rouge. It happened in Baton Rouge earlier that year, in 55, but no one knew about it. Dr. King knew about it, but what Jemison and them did uh, didn't hit. It didn't move the meter, mm -hmm. so to speak. But what Dr. King and them were able to do before you knew it, reporters from the North, Midwest, as far away as California, was coming in there because they heard about it and said, black folks is walking in Montgomery. And it's been going on a while, so after six months, eight months, it didn't close last to that a year, mm -hmm. it went to a point where they was like, wow, you know, we gotta check this out. So overnight, he became the preeminent leader. Now, you had the NAACP, which for the most part was the premier um, civil rights organization. They, it's hands down, they were the premier civil rights organization at that time. And you have to understand history to understand that. Because if now you're looking at the NAACP, you don't look at them in the eyes the way black folks looked at them in the 50s. Right. You know, totally different. That was the place to go. Yeah, CORE was around then and other organizations, um, Urban League and all that, but it was nothing like the NAACP, where the legal division was led by, at that time, Thurgood Marshall, because in 1950, um, Charles Hamilton Houston had passed. So um, by the time of the Montgomery bus boycott, Thurgood Marshall was the man, and um, and it was so it was so fierce, it was so fierce that um, white folks all over, and you know, and of course at that time you had the Mega Evers and other people in the organization, uh, making you know making great strides. Mm -hmm. So at that time you had this relatively unknown in '52 come out of jail and go to work for the NOI, which was unknown. Mm -hmm. National, you know, uh, um, Nation of Islam was relatively unknown at that time. Brand as new. Malcolm and all of them described, no, it was, goes back to 1930, it wasn't brand new. But at that time, at their national convention, which is Savior's Day, you could put uh, a, a few buses together and take the entire nation to Detroit or to Chicago, wherever the gathering was going to be for that year. 
And um, you could do that just like that at that time, prior to Malcolm. When Malcolm came on the scene, he wasn't content with having um, Detroit and a few people in Chicago, a couple of people in D.C. They, they didn't have a mosque, and a person or two in Philly, they didn't have mosques, but these were places where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, when he was running all over the country, people were trying to kill him, former members and people who disagreed with what he was doing. And um, these were people that came into the nation around the time he did, and there was a split. So these were people that uh, had a problem with him, but wherever he went at, he talked to a few people. So they had a few people that it, w it wouldn't be strange to if you introduced the philosophy and the thinking of the nation of Islam at that time. These were uh, scattered believers. But Malcolm, when he hit the ground, he was running. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, he went from place to place organizing. And that's when at that point, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, okay, that's, that's when at that time, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad realized, I got a jewel here, and I got to put him to work. Mm -hmm. And at that point is when Malcolm became um, he wasn't the national spokesperson yet, but he became Mosque the minister himself. that was going to go around all over and build mosques. And um, Elijah Muhammad did come to the conclusion that to have a national organization, you need the base here in New York. And, and that was the biggest challenge, develop a mosque in New York, which was Mosque Number 7. And uh, when he did that, um, everything really is history in terms of Malcolm's uh, mantle of leadership because he was able to travel. Now, I, I really, what I'll do is that I'll explain some of the pitfalls of Malcolm and, and Dr. King later, but philosophically, they were totally different. One was intent on dealing in the system. Mm -hmm. One was intent on building in an insular way, inside of our community, not from the outside, not uh, dependent on funding like the NAACP, Urban League Corps, all of them, and to, or, and to organize our people as separatists. But the civil rights organization were what we would commonly call integration. integration. Mm -hmm. right. You know, they were going to integrate. They, their whole thing was to integrate. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be close to white people. They still do. Yeah, they still do. <laughs> you got that right. There are certain people that still don't feel right if you ain't around white folks. Right. Mm -hmm. You want to get into a white neighborhood, you want to be able to say, I'm the only one that lives here. Yeah. You want to yeah. be on a job that's primarily white and mm -hmm. you've got a position there. Uh, and, and, and so that dynamic still exists to this day, to say the least. We, we understand that. And um, Self-hatred. It's self-hate, but it really comes down to what you're going to do with what you got. You know, Adam Clayton Powell said it best, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? That's right. What's in your hand? Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to stop here, and then I'll get into their philosophy and how they led, what were their agreements, what were their disagreements, and in that you see yourself, where you would go with that, what you would do in that certain, in, in those distinct situations, and then um, from there, what we will do now. We'll stop right here. And, um, uh, at this time, there's food. You stop the tape? Yeah. There's food. There's bread. I'm saying. I'm Yo, telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. When you look at the different philosophies about leadership and what to do, the time, and what must be done, you're going to understand why nothing is being, no, very little is being done. You know what I want to know? I come to line and never wrote my prescription. <laughs> What? Understood. Understanding. Understood. Well, we we I, I, maybe we want to wait from that.
you were supposed to treat other people's illnesses. If something is wrong, you write out a prescription. If the person is sick, the person who put their hands on Dr. Ben, why wasn't the prescription written out for that person? We back? Yep. Okay. Okay, so we're going to continue down that same vein. Uh, and this time, before I was just building a foundation of who Dr. King was and who Malcolm was and where they came from and how their paths were so different and how they eventually, on some levels, came together and yet still apart, but came together in some areas yet distinctly still apart. Now, Dr. King, as you know, after the Montgomery bus boycott, he was considered the preeminent leader over Wilkins and all these other guys, uh, NAACP and, and, and um, other Randolph. leaders at that time. He became the guy. He, in 57, he didn't rest on his laurels. He went right to Ghana to celebrate their independence, something most people don't even realize. That's true. You know, that you would think that a man like Dr. King, looking at his history, would not identify with the black struggle. He actually went to Ghana to celebrate its independence over its former colonial rulers. So he went to Ghana right away. Most people don't know that. Now, Adam Clayton Powell was there also. But Dr. King was there. Very, very important to see that in this, in the, in the infancy of his leadership, he knew that he had to be there. And was there when the great Asajj uh, Kwame Nkrumah declared Ghana independent. So he did that, and most people don't realize that. Dr. King was on a book tour uh, of his first book. Um, what was the name of that book? I forgot. It, it, I'll tell you in a minute. But on that book tour, it's, it's something about the lesson of freedom. It's something for freedom. Anybody knows can tell me, and it'll save me a minute. But, uh, stride toward freedom. Yeah, stride toward freedom. That's it. Uh, he was hand hauled, as we well know. And um, that sister Izola, she comes up to him and, and asks him, is he Dr. King? Of course, he says, yes, he's Dr. King. And she said, um, I've been looking for you for five years. And pulls out a letter opener, stabs him in his chest. Uh, they rush him to Harlem Hospital. It takes three hours for him to remove the letter opener from his chest. Because they said, had it just, had he moved slightly at all, it would have punched his aorta. Mm -hmm. I think that's a valve in the heart. It's the largest, it's the largest yeah. artery in your body. It's the largest artery the largest in your heart? Yeah, bring, yeah. The, bring, the, bring the blood from the heart to the body. Okay. Well, the point of the letter opener was right there actually touching it. And it said if he, if he sneezed. Right, that's what uh, I think was named. Dr. Franklin told him later, if you had just sneezed, it might have penetrated your aorta and you would have uh, bled, you know, bled to death in internally. Um, so um, it took three, that's why it took three hours to actually remove, remove that all that open. In conventional thinking, people think that when you get stabbed, you pull the knife out right away. In most situations, you're not supposed to do that. You know, if, whether it was your, uh, in your stomach, or even if it was in your eye or something, you leave it there, something got stuck in your eye, you don't try to pull it out before you get to the doctor. If you can, you leave it there. People take a cup. EMS would take a cup or something like that and put it over your eye, or they would cover the area and leave it there until the doctor, you know, would get to it and they would fix, fix you up that way. So he was actually, um, it took three hours to 
removed that letter and, and of course after that they stabilized him and that's when the doctor told him what you said about uh, if he had just sneezed he would have died. Now the lady, I don't know, I guess they consider her crazy. She said she was looking, I thought it was interesting that she told him she was looking for him for five years. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was not known for five years. He had just started the boycott in, in 55 and nobody knew who he was. It ended in 57, 13 months later, but here uh, a year later, in, in 58, she said she was looking for him for five years, so her math was off or something was off because uh, he was not famous for even five years oh, at that time. Of course. Yeah, it something, was something behind that. Back when you're going to say I'm going to say preachers. Yes. You know what happened to her? No. no. Well, Back she was arrested. Uh, no, I don't really know uh, how it turned out. I think they put her in, 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 in asylum. But I don't know what happened after that. You know, they put her away for that. I guess they considered her to be insane. But what happened to her after that, I'm not sure. But, um... So in any event, uh, Dr. King was able to survive that. And of course, after that, he formed um, what became the Southern, Cre Southern Christian Leadership Organization. Um, and they were on the move. So he continued. He did not stop at the Montgomery Improvement Association. Now you have Malcolm, mm -hmm. who we got out, like I said, in 52, hit the ground running. And then before you know it, uh, developed a very unique and a real sincere relationship with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It was so sincere that he became like a son. Even though Elijah had a lot of sons, he referred to Malcolm as a son. They were that close. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm went all over the country to Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, Point West and Milwaukee, Midwest, and set up mosques all over. Uh, Malcolm was able to go throughout the former confederacy and build mosques in, in an area traditionally that was Christian, but was able to um, do that. And, it, and as a matter of fact, uh, even the Detroit people and Chicago people, they come from the Deep South. Mm -hmm. Consequently, they were Christian. Mm -hmm. So he was converting primarily Christians all over the country to the nation of Islam. And, and their unique uh, philosophical beliefs. Now, as you well know, it's good to have an inside strategy and an outside strategy. Um, in basketball, you are a good team. You have to have inside strength and outside strength. So if you have a big man, you got Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Chamberlain, somebody, Shaq. You're good on the inside, and if you have a Kobe, people like that on the outside, you got a perimeter and you got an inside, that's the beginning of what can be a great team. Because you've got the inside strength and outside strength. So too with the movement. You need people that can articulate uh, your views and your positions. That's why the Thurgood Marshals of the world was extremely important for him. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Charles Hamrich in Houston, uh, even Dr. King's personal lawyer, uh, Gray, Attorney Gray. They were all uh, great individuals in their own right. You need that for the courtroom. You also need an arm of the movement that will demonstrate on the outside. Even um, Gandhi had that. Uh, even Gandhi had that. While Gandhi uh, was uh, the paragon of this so-called um, nonviolent um, direct action, he had many people in India, millions, masses, who were who would take the violence in a moment mm -hmm. if there was no other alternative. This is why the British government dealt with him. It wasn't no secret that if they didn't deal with him, they would have to deal with the alternative. And they did not have the manpower to control <coughs> India without cooperation from various leadership and organizations and ultimately young um, people that could basically control others. Same thing here. When Malcolm went in the South, Dr. King was arrested. One of the times he was arrested, 
Malcolm was invited to speak at that forum. He sat right next to Coretta. And he and and um, basically he was just telling her some of the things he was gonna, gonna discuss. And she was like, whoa. And he said, well, I'm trying to help your husband. And she said, What do you mean? And he said, you know, with the things that I'm saying, they're gonna have to let your husband go and deal with him. That's right. Mm -hmm. So he was that other alternative, and he understood his position. You know, when you know, um, when you understand military science, <coughs> you look at things in the military, in the military is no camouflaging, it's no make-believe, pretend, you know, you call things the way they are, you know, and um, similar to um, anybody that, you know, if you're not into a fairy tale well, world, you understand the enemy, mm -hmm. and you know what positions they are, what their capabilities are, and what you can do against that enemy, or do you need to retreat and gather the forces and then come back uh, in a more strategic way. Well, Malcolm understood that Dr. King was the point man for black America, and he didn't try to take that from him. Malcolm was basically trying to teach people, and it was a little harder, you know, because the church is the church. It's the nature of the church is, is, is um, conservative. So you, you, it's hard for you, you know, when you say, you um, were able to overturn traditional laws in the South through a boycott. Well, Malcolm gonna say, "Why didn't you buy the bus?" Mm -hmm. Right? He gonna mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. Now, it's gonna, some people are gonna get mad at that because mm -hmm. they say, "Man, this was about dignity." And Malcolm would say, "Well, separation is the way. You want to be dignified. Show that you respect yourself. Show that you respect black dollars." Mm -hmm and deal among your own. Buy the buses, have your own buses, let them have their own buses. But this is a different philosophy. Mm -hmm. Because one said, no, I don't want to destroy their buses. We want to work together, you know, integration. And, and, and to those who want to knock that, because I know a lot of people that say today, man, um, I would never follow Dr. King. Mm -hmm. You can say that all you want. Mm -hmm. Dr. King moved the meter. Mm -hmm. Dr. King moved the meter. The South, mm -hmm. now you can go to school in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to, you know, of course it took him back there. a lot of people. I'm not saying in one fell swoop, Dr. King did this by no means, but I'm saying the Civil Rights Movement did it. You know, because I heard somebody earlier mention the Black Panther Party. And that, that was a necessary element also. That's the black power movement. That's a little different. The, the father of that, in its genesis, at that time, you could say was Malcolm was the embodiment of it. That, that stuff goes back to Martin Delaney and others. Mm -hmm. You know, that militancy. But I'm just saying, at that time, at that time, Malcolm embodied that because the Black Panther Party, tell you yourself, its founders, and his members will say that they believed in what Malcolm told. Republic of New Africa, Ram, Negroes with Guns, all of them <coughs> Malcolm. Rosa Parks, she pointed to Malcolm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and said that she was so motivated about what happened to Emmett Till. And she admired Malcolm. She might have been with Dr. King, but she admired Malcolm. No, what woman uh, uh, that's, that, that has character? would not respect a man who say, if a white man touch you, I will cut his arm off. Mm -hmm. You said you bring back a nub. <laughs> right? Me. Mm -hmm. You understand? <laughs> so, women respect that. I mean, they, they not gonna knock you if you say, well, honey, you know, there's a different way. They might go along with it, but they respect a black man mm -hmm. who's no nonsense, does not deal in foolishness, that will kill a dead tree. Mm -hmm. And that's what our women respect, always have and always will. Mm -hmm. You know, but Dr. King and them had their own way. The Civil Rights Movement, I'm not blaming this on Dr. King. It was a movement. A movement is bigger than a person. So philosophically, they felt the way was to draw compassion from white men. But if a white man has no conscience, you can't make him feel ashamed. So the strategy always was to be beaten up kicked, spit on, 
uh, dogs sick on you, water hoses. They love those kind of police commissioners that would do that. Dr. King would be disappointed if he went, which happened several times. He would go into a town where um, the police commissioner in that town, or public safety director, whatever they was called at, at that time, so the ones who would um, um, emphasize restraint, Dr. King movement didn't move. The ones who said, when those you know what, and you know what they called us, you know that famous word they called us. I know nobody in this room used it, but other places they did, you know, that, that the word nigga. I know none of us here called each other nigga, right? Mm -hmm. Right, I'll show you, right? <laughs> I caught some of y'all. I walked right behind some of y'all one of them days and you said, yo nigga, what's up? That's my nigga. I won't say who, but I caught a couple of y'all. Uh -huh. in, in any event, um, the ones that would do that, look, you know, right here in Philly, just so y'all won't get geographical on me and think of just the South, think of uh, Georgia, Alabama, and back to those places like this. Rizzo in Philly, oh yeah. he was quoted. Black folks were, were doing a demonstration one day in Philadelphia, and Rizzo was so enraged. He was the, he was the police commissioner yeah. and the mayor. He rose from the rank of patrolman, you know, a street cop, went through every rank, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, everything. All the way to the top and became mayor. He, when he was police commissioner, black folks were doing a demonstration. I know Ray know the one I'm talking about. They were doing a demonstration, and he was so enraged, he's standing there looking at it, and there was reporters all around him. And he said, Man, he said, I can't wait till these cameras leave. He said, Because I'm going to split every nigga head out here. He said, As soon as these cameras leave. He said, all the niggas we catch out there, we're going to split their heads. <laughs> and the newspaper's like, <clears throat> writing it down. He didn't care. This He's like, it, once that last camera leaves, mm -hmm. it's on. Martin, mm -hmm. Martin never so, got uh, hurt in the South. He always so, got hurt in the North. No, he got, he got, he, he, he got never got North. hurt in the South. Always in the North. I think he got hurt in the South when you look at the dogs. And you look at the water hoses, he was hurting. Mm -hmm. But he wanted that to happen. As I said, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, I mean, a lot of us, obviously in 2019, will say it's a flawed strategy to depend on the compassion of your enemy. That even if your enemy does not emit compassion, his people watching it on TV mm -hmm. will be aghast and say, how could they allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. No, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. So you get the attorney general, you know, Robert Kennedy, or you get uh, a certain governor, say, look, man, can we talk? Let's, let's talk. Or you get the attorney general, the president himself, <laughs> call Coretta, saying, Coretta, we call, and actually call Coretta at home. Mm -hmm. And we'll say to her, look, we're concerned about your husband. Don't worry about it. We're going to send some federal people down there. We've already spoke to Alabama, and they've said they're not going to do nothing to your husband. Because, you know, things can happen mm -hmm. in a jail in Alabama, Mississippi, and all the places. And um, you just hung yourself. So, obviously, whether it was the Kennedy Johnson administration, they made that clear that wasn't going to happen. They let them know, look, man, you know, first of all, we want you to let them go. But until you let them go, you know, we don't want no accidents. You know, I mean, you, you know what the Godfather said in the movie. Godfather said, you know, I'm trying to bring my son Michael back. Mm -hmm. And if he slips on a banana, if he chokes on a fish bone, I'm going to blame somebody in his room. And the peace is over. Because he knows those accidents will happen. Mm -hmm. So he said, there ain't going to be no accidents you know, when I bring my son back. And all of them had to agree because he said it's going to be war. And by that, he means total war, you know. It's not going to be no peace. I'll kill everybody in this room if something happened to my son. Well, they didn't want anything to happen to Dr. King. And, you know, the oftentimes, all the times he was in jail, so, you know, in, in jail, so. They got those assurances, and those governors was hard-pressed to let Dr. King go. You had 
Some governors said, no, that you know what, he's going to stay here. We're not letting him out. And Kennedy had to send his attorney general and say, look, man, go down there and tell him, let him go. Let him out. Well, he did so and so. I don't care what he did. Let him out. Because now the world is watching. You got the Soviet Union right. saying, look at this. The Soviet bloc, all these people all over the world mm -hmm. saying, look at this. You got Africa saying, look at this. The entire Caribbean saying, look <laughs> what they doing to him. So that was um, basically the Dr. King strategy is a nonviolent movement based on what they felt to be right. It was a moral thing. Malcolm didn't feel the white man had morals. Mm -hmm. His philosophy <clears throat> dictated that the white man is the devil. Mm -hmm. Not the spooky devil with a pitchfork and all that other stuff, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah, was the um, what would you call it? the incarnation of evil. The epitome. <laughs> the incarnation of evil itself. Devoid of compassion, moral truth, Consequently, there's no good in him. He is non-redeemable. Consequently, you can't base a philosophy on compassion. It has to be self-reliance, self-independent, as the nation called the do for self. So they built up an empire that had an economic um, engine. If you look at the civil rights movement, they did not have an economic engine. Mm -hmm. Core didn't have mm -hmm. an economic engine. Urban League, all of them, NAACP. Matter of fact, at that time, and still to this day, the NAACP didn't even own their own headquarters. They paid rent. Mm -hmm. And that's not their decision. It was the white people that financed the right. decision. To this day, right. all, every major civil rights organization is controlled by white money, so-called white liberal money, yeah. primarily Jews and others, <coughs> controls them, and they can't make a move. Right. This is why when you see um, when you see injustices in plain sight and you want to move, they move in the quality, and those people um, got them in those positions because they can they can put out fires, mm -hmm. Sharp and Jesse and others. Yeah. They can put out fires, and that's what they pay for. The moment they can no longer do that, they're out. Right? Mm -hmm. They're finished, and they will be replaced by someone else that can do that. So that's the do two um, prevailing philosophies. You can go back to um, Booker T and look at his whole self-reliance but at the same time, it was independent, even though um, he was the point man at that time, and he was calling the shots, and then you saw the Monroe Trotters of the world, and um, um, <coughs> W.B. Du Bois, that took sharp disagreement with that talent at 10%. So that energy has always been there. So uh, when you look at, and I'm going to open it up right now for, for q and I'm just saying that Malcolm was bound by the nation's philosophy. Malcolm was extremely disturbed. Betty said, Betty Shabazz, his wife, said the only time she ever seen Malcolm cry was when the brother from um, Los Angeles, Mars number 27, mm -hmm. who used to be here in New York, he was the secretary, when he was killed by LAPD. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm wanted to fight. Those brothers was trained, disciplined, for war to FOI through this long. Um, and she never saw her husband cry his entire life like what she saw him cry when that brother was killed. Shot him um, in his torso and in his groin. Uh, killed him. And just on um, the excuse about noise and all that other stuff going yeah. on, they wanted to investigate. The brother was praying at the time and they killed him um, and Malcolm wanted war. And Elijah Muhammad said, no, no, cool it. And um, had a problem with, with some of the language Malcolm was using. And, um, and that was um, a little crack in the wall, so to speak. Um, and the FBI 
is experts at exploiting cracks in the wall. Mm -hmm. They knew that there was some tension there. Mm -hmm. And um, some other things happened. Of course, you know that uh, the Kennedy statement, the Kennedy remarks when, when, when um, Kennedy was um, assassinated. Yeah, who's, who's come on um, who's? Looking back at it now in 2019, it doesn't look like a bad statement, but you also have to understand context and perspective. Remember, context and perspective. You have to understand at that time, Americans, white Americans especially, but even some blacks, actually cried mm -hmm. when Kennedy was assassinated. Yeah. Now, if you can't understand that, what I'm saying to you now is meaningless. But you have to understand that people adored this young, energetic president mm -hmm. and his new ideas. Loved him, loved that man. Now, was he what he, what the image was? No. 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 But no. well, not in jail. However, his image was a caring, young um, president that wanted to do what was best for the country. That's why he said, ask not what you can do for, you know, for the country, but what, what, what you can do for the Ask not what the country can do for you, but what you can do for the country. You know, when he said things like a penny saved, a penny earned, he was just that energetic. He had an image of what a president should be. Charismatic. He was extremely charismatic. Uh, and, um, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad understood that this president was loved and adored. And that's why he told Malcolm. Told Malcolm, because it was actually Elijah Muhammad was supposed to be <coughs> in Manhattan Center and speak that night. Uh -huh. But he was the one that said, no, nah, cancer. Malcolm was the one that said, no, um, you know, um, uh, the apostle. Let's, let's do that because it'll bring in money to the nation. Let's, let's have it. He said, let me speak in your place. Honorable Elijah Muhammad was hesitant, but he said, okay, Malcolm, because Malcolm by that time was on a little thin ice, like I said, the thing that happened in Los Angeles and some other things. So, and, and, and there were some jealousies obviously developing in the royal family, Elijah Muhammad's family. So he was on a little thin ice already, but he was the national spokesperson. And like I said, they had a, a serious love for each other, but the FBI was working. FBI had been on Malcolm's trail and actually was under surveillance going back way before that. Malcolm in, Malcolm in about 48, 1948, they wrote a letter <coughs> from jail. <coughs> And this was prior to, you know, just understanding the philosophy and all that stuff with the nation. Malcolm wrote a letter claiming to be a communist and saying that he was against the Korean War. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and that put him under surveillance. And he wrote that to Truman. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like he wrote the letter to somebody else and they just picked it up by accident. He wrote the letter to Harry Truman. But now let's let's go to Q and A because um, I've got that signal for Ray. So let's go to Q and A. Uh, all the things that y'all wanted to say before, I know some of y'all. Just just um, come on out. Let's let's have some Q and A. Quick let's question. talk about what you want to talk about. Yes, sir. Quick question, brother. Uh, Mike, I really really appreciate you. I appreciate the time you spend in the community trying to share that knowledge. Thank you. you. Know, one of the things that really really disheartened me is that when I see these rooms, I see these see these venues like that uh, like this, we don't have any young people in there. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to have some young people in here yes, sir. to be able to continue this, this, this movement, you know. Uh, I spent 27 years in the labor movement. When I first got into the labor movement, I thought we were going to be able to change all this. Ain't nothing happening. Anyway, my question is this. You know, uh, uh, um, um, during, during the times of King and, 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 and Brother Malcolm, uh, you kept mentioning the conservatives, and the uh, liberals, mm -hmm. you know, could you just explain what's the difference between the two? <coughs> Conservative and liberal? Could you let the brother speak, brother? Um, it's kind of hard to explain it, but I'll say that a conservative 
for the most part, is a person who believes, for the most part, in original intent. They believe that this country should be re a, a reflection of what the original founding fathers believed. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, nothing less. You can't add, you can't take away. So they believe in a country <coughs> that's, um, uh, that you can't add. So in other words, literally all the amendments, I mean, it's, they could never imagine a black man legally walking around with a weapon. You know, they couldn't imagine mm -hmm. you um, actually <clears throat> can stand before the powers of Congress, uh, a state assembly or something like that, mm -hmm. and demonstrate and agitate. They couldn't imagine a uh, black man sheriffs, a black sheriff, what's right. that? You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, black uh, legislators mm -hmm. in Albany, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. they can't imagine you having the right to vote on an equal level with them, that's conservative. The liberals are so-called the ones who, who are open to change. Mm -hmm. Change for the better. Uh, that's allegedly. Now there are some people who pretend to be liberal depending on your geography. Mm -hmm. In other words, why would you be a member of the Republican Party in Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. If you want to get elected, <clears throat> right? So yeah. it, it wouldn't be feasible. You you'd be better in Staten Island, that's right, or Long Island. So I'm just saying that the difference in the two uh, is philosophical on its basis, and then obviously if there's physical physical concerns. Um, the way money is made, generated, divided out, that's a a, a distinction also. But politically. So I would say that that's the basic difference. Now, uh, people from down south will tell you that traditionally, especially in the times we discussed in that, they like a conservative guy because at least you know where you at. You know where he's at, so if you're dealing with the Eastlands and you're dealing with the Bull Connors, yeah. at least you know what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. as opposed to, as Malcolm characterized, it's Kennedy as a fox. Or, or the term Dixie Crest. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's the basic difference. Yes, brother. Yeah, I want to I want to say that um, one thing about 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 the sixties and the movement was going on. I was part of it. I, I grew up in it. Anyway, when when Martin Luther King was talking about this peace and turn the other cheek and all that, that was a strategy of strength and all that other shit, right? Listen, and when. The, Cameras actually show them kids, them kids being sprayed and all that shit by them gun hoses. That's when the white people had a conscience. Malcolm had a conscience before that. Malcolm said, if you put your hand on me, listen, you're going to bring back a nub. You understand? He was, he was the same thing. You had Malcolm in the East and you had the Black Panther Party in the West. And them boys didn't want no parts of none of that. Okay. They said, let me go to Mark, yeah. let me go to Martin Luther King, because we don't want either or. Well, that's a strategy in itself. Oh. Yes, brother. <coughs> um, my, my question, it, it may be a little bit of but, but, but like we're talking about uh -huh. civil rights. When you think about the Civil Rights Act of 1860s being in the Supreme Court right now. Which one? The Civil Rights Act of 1866. Well, it, it, it was bought, 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 bought by Byron, Byron Allen actually sued uh, right. a, a charter and, 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 and a Comcast. He, he, he lost in the lower courts well, and in the Ninth Circuit agreed, but, but then one of, them they, one of them took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, I'm not dealing with your lawsuit, but we're going to deal with the, <coughs> with the uh, civil rights. Well, at that time, you have to remember that these were serious changes that the South never really accepted. Uh, these accommodations in, in um, 1866, uh, that was a year out of slavery. Right. Mm -hmm. And some locales actually allowed you to go to a theater, maybe in the balcony. Mm -hmm. Some still staunchly refused. 
these mm -hmm. acts were all um, <coughs> were devastated uh, with with um, Bradley um, in 1877 when he decided uh, during that constitutional crisis uh, all of those 13, 14, 15 amendment, uh, the legislation you're, you're referring to, um, all of these were uh, just uh, gutted at that time. You know, him, seven Republicans and seven Democrats uh, gave Ruth Ruth B. Hayes the presidency with the understanding that all federal troops had to be removed from the South. And when they were removed, the most bloodiest period you've mm -hmm. ever seen in your yeah, life right. transpired. Right. Blacks that had duly elected offices mm -hmm. in Mississippi and other places, North Carolina, Georgia, all of them were systematically removed. And just in case you don't know, at that time, black folks were in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. The Democrats were the party of slavery. Yeah, yeah. The Republican Party, uh, I won't say that they were anti-slavery, but they had members, you know, that were anti-slavery. Le so, so, so you're saying that, 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 that this law, hold on. You're saying that this law is not valid? Today? No, I'm not saying it's not valid because I understand. Look, you have to understand. And, and I, I, you know, I was looking at Byron Allen stuff going back a few years ago with Comcast and MSNBC and all of them. <coughs> but you have to remember, Reverend Sharpton, Jesse Jackson accepted millions of dollars. That's right. This was, a few, this was during do. the time of Obama. Obama, it was in 2015 and 2016, when Obama was still in office, <clears throat> he was the one who was upholding net neutrality. It was these Negroes, and then they had uh, uh, Latino organizations. They brought them all under one tent and divided something like $1.2 billion. I got it in my notes. I don't, I don't have it with me now. I'm sorry, but at that time, all of these organizations divided $1.2 billion, which is chicken feed to what they were going to do. So Byron Allen, what he's doing is right. And that's why he intentionally named them to dramatize things to black folks, what these power corporations are doing, because they got money. Yeah. Rainbow yeah. Lewis and Shopton yeah. and all of them got money. Yeah. So that's yeah. why he included them in the lawsuit. Now he said back then when he first did it, he said these are peons, they're nobody. Mm -hmm. He said, but I'm putting them in it mm -hmm. so that our people will know they play ball with them. So that's why he did that. And um uh but but you gotta remember, that's a reach on By Byron Allen for him to go back to 1866. He didn't he didn't do it. The, the, the Supreme Court. Decided that they was gonna look look at the yeah yeah but but I'm saying his lawyers had already looked at all the legislation to show that the black community being targeted they had they had a panoply of things to look at and they understood that all of those things that was targeting us uh, had to be challenged and that's why they did that yes brother yes okay thank you for your time um, thank you you um you spoke with Martin Luther in the uh, the, what was it called? The referendum that he mailed to the door of the church? Yes. Which is what they... they yes, they that's the at Protestant. Right. Um, 1611. Thank you. I just here recently learned that the phrase Protestant actually comes from the word protestant. As in yeah. The protestant yeah. That's church. what it means. So, it's, it's actually a two-part question. The first part of the question is, um, when are we going to nail our referendum to the door of the movement that we have now since uh, based on what brother said things right haven't, now. things hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So when are we gonna nail that to the door to the door? And also um, independence is great, like you know, Pan Africanism is so good, but even though the British leave or the Germans leave or the Belgians leave or the Belgians leave, mm -hmm. we're still dealing with Belgian bankers and British bankers. Yes. And, so the, the true freedom comes when you have financial independence. Right. right. So how can we how can we get to that? Well, well, brother, and and I, and I love the question. Good question. It's, it's a great question. Great. You have to understand. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I asked the wrong question. We all know great how to get question. there. But the question is, when are we going to abandon this virtual comfortability to get there, and how well, do we get about? Well, I would say that none of us are really comfortable. We just don't know. 
Where are we going? That's why I said, where do we go? Mark the mountain. The thing you have to understand is, you have to meet a black man and black woman where they are. Now, it's true what you say. When you mention Africa being independent, and then somebody says, well, if they're independent, how would the bees and all of them still uh, able to extract that which they want? How would all the coltan and all that stuff being taken out of Congo? In places like that, you still have to meet people where they are. Okay. Dr. King would have people singing, you know, mm. I am, I am somebody, and repeating things before you will go out and march. Right. Because, and you don't understand that if you don't understand the times in which we live. So to convince black people, people that had seventh and eighth grade educations at best, and could sign their name the documents, but weren't that sophisticated, how do you get them to march and demonstrate? You got to tell them this is God's will, this is God's way, and if you people of God, this is how you do it. And to convince them, um, Malcolm uh, talked about manhood and emphasized manhood in a way that would make a man stand up because it's very, it was very hard then, and for some of us, even hard now, because to look at a white man in the eye. Because the men he's talking to, everybody's calling him boy, so he appeals to them. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I'm saying, if we're talking about removing the debates, you would first have to remove the elected leadership in your very own community. So they, believe me, in all of these various African countries where all this exploitation is going, you don't think that somebody's on profit from it? Of course not. You don't think in Haiti there's, there's an elite class? Oh, of course not. Of course. So I'm saying that to say that you still have to meet people where they are, extremely difficult, and there are a lot of sellouts among us. Mm. They, and, 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 and with the elite class, you have to remember, they have things like the Tata Maku and all mm. And so their hands are going to look clean. Right. Their hands are going to look clean. They're going to have people come see you. So right now, try to um, try to get uh, something simplistic. You know, because somebody said they was out of the labor movement. Try to get um, the uh, try to organize at Walmart and get people to form a union. Oh my God. Try it. You don't think nobody's gonna come see you? I mean, they bleed just like I do, so I'm not, that's not Right, well, that might be your mentality, but you think everybody's got that mentality? No, sir. But that's, that's, gotta, that's the nature But that's the, the mentality we gotta force them. Because they might keep sitting around waiting for something to happen, waiting for some great, some great Messiah to come and bring it. It's not gonna happen. No, no, no hell. It's not gonna happen. People gotta stop thinking that everything is all right and start knowing that it ain't all right. Yes, sir. You know? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to say to everyone in here, including myself, and though I know. So we, first of all, you're going to have to wake up to who you really are. Let's get that straight. Okay? Because, you know, you keep on I've been coming here listening, listening, listening. And nobody's talking. They're talking always about these people doing this, doing that. But who are you? Do you who know are you? Who you are? Sister, I know who I am. Who are you? I'm first born on this planet. Okay. That's who and I am. And I don't know more, but I won't go there. And a dynamic system. But the point is that we have to know who we are. We have to, and that's what's going to get us out the book. Right? You keep on playing into their bullshit. First of all, when they came here to this country, they didn't discover anything. Number one. Number two, when they came here, there was presidents here. They were already black. You know, they took and switched everything Man, they, around. Who were the presidents? Okay. Uh, there were none, sister. They, they, we're going to be true okay. and frank well, here. Be there were no presidents. We have no to black stop, presidents. Well, we have to stop believing that we are less than what we are. I agree we with you. We are the highest. I and agree with you on that. Once we get to that fact, okay, again, but sister, hold on. We'll on the foundation of truth, there were no presidents. Okay. I know you have heard these things about there were uh, several black presidents before George Washington. Right. That's all so. untrue. I never heard that. I'm just it's being a book. just being factual. It's a book. I never right? heard it's that. A book, it's a book, and it's not true. I never heard that. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about um, <clears throat> Jay Rogers, the, the five Jay presidents. Rogers. I'm not talking about that. I've never She's heard talking that. about something different that the Moors have been putting out there for years. It's all garbage. They talking about. No, 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 no. They talking about. Um, 
uh, uh, John Hanson. I've never heard that. Being the first black president of America, and it's nothing but hogwash. And and just remember, there were during the Articles of Confederation, there were they started like in about uh, Article uh, 1783. Hold on, brother. It's about 1783. They were forming what would be America. It was a concept of 13 various Colonies. nations or colonies, whatever you want to call them, to form what we came to be America. At that time, in these Articles of Confederation, every year a different person sat over the Articles of Confederation in Philadelphia. Now, the, these 13 colonies sent three to four delegates from all over the country. There were no pictures then, so when the Moors show you a picture of a black man, it's a damn lie. There was no such thing as pictures then. Pictures didn't come around until 40, 50 years later. In the late 1830s, early 40s, is when what's now known as cameras and pictures to be in existence. Consequently, you're talking about white men. If you look at the paintings, look at the paintings of those so-called founding fathers. You see 45 to 50 men in that room where they hash things out over about seven years to form what now is America. These are the facts. Don't let anybody lying tell you that John Hanson was a black man. John Hanson was a white man. There was an elected official named John Hanson about 90 years later. Now, all we, do we agree that all the men in that room uh, 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 that was hashing out what would be America were all grown men? So how did 90 years later, after these grown men who were all 30 and 40 Jefferson and, and, and Hancock and all of them, all in the room, and George Washington in a military uniform, all of them in the room together, and, and um, a black man is in charge of them? Are you out of your damn mind? Stop that foolishness. The people that formed America, the people that had us enslaved, if, they, if there was a John Hanson that was a black man, wouldn't um, uh, Harry Tubman have told us about him? <laughs> wouldn't Fred Douglas have said something? What about Martin Delaney? What, what, wouldn't one of them have said, yo, you know, brother, you know, we got people in the South in, in bondage. What you doing? Wouldn't one of them have said something? But do you we ain't got no black man during that time that spoke up and said anything about a black president. Now we got some Johnny come lately telling us, oh, you didn't know we had a black It's silliness. May I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Look at the timeline and we'll yes. dispense with the stuff. We'll go right ahead. Okay. This country was not discovered by no European. Before yes. Europeans came into existence, we were here first. We had open all over the I country. concur. Okay, so then we have to get back to that. That's what I'm trying to show here, our roots. Who okay. was here? Okay, but I'm just talking charge. about, they say, John Hanson. No, it was, and he was the first yeah, person of seven. It was Minister Brown, mm -hmm. it was about seven different white men. They had an agreement. While they was hashing out what would be America, you sat in that seat for one year. After that year was over, guess what? You sat back down in your seat and somebody came up and chaired. Those are what they call the closest things to a president at that time. George Washington was not elected. He was selected. He didn't have a Democratic Party. It wasn't a Republican Party. It was nothing. He was selected by the men in that room. Correct. They didn't know what to name him. They asked him, did he want to be king? Exactly. He said, no. He said, we ain't go through all this. We just unseated the king from power here. I'm not going to be a new king. He said, I'd rather be president. They said, what do you want to be called? Your honor, sir, your most majesty, your this and that. He said, Mr. President. And to this day, what do they refer to presidents as? President. Mr. President. Mr. When, they, when you get off that plane, when you're getting on the plane, when the Marines salute you, they say, Mr. President, yeah, Mr. to this very day. Yeah, and that Trump. comes straight from George Washington. 
There was no black guy in the room unless he was either serving coffee or sweet. <laughs> and I'm telling you the damn truth. We have to get out the mask because, like I said, they didn't discover this country. Yes, brother Christian. I, they didn't discover the country. Who was there before Columbus? I Who did? That Who did? We weren't president. Job yeah. is juicy America. Hey, I like I like to point out one one thing. Uh, you know, while we're discussing this stuff, uh, the word integration. When they first started the uh, demonstrations down south, it wasn't for integration. It was called desegregation. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So Some use that term desegregation. In other words, you know, a push for diversity. But you know, they were considered as a group integrationalist. But you're right. It would desegregate. Well, you know, yeah, that term is permissible. Sure. Yeah. But you know what? I'm tired. I'm Hold tired. Hold on, brother. The sister's next in the back. Um, I'm an elder, like many of us here, mm -hmm. and the young man that walked out, unfortunately, he asked a question, and your answer was basically, you meet people where they are now. Yes. 2020, we're going into 2020. Mm -hmm. Young people now are not where we were. And he asked a valid question for an answer. Mm -hmm. There are so many fractions of young people now that are looking for answers, not of yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's good to talk about those that we're standing on the shoulders of, but the young people want to know how to go forward. Right. You know? Young people have always wanted to know how to go forward. We're standing on shoulders, but if you ask people whose shoulders we standing on, most of us in this room can't identify those those, those shoulders. But even now that's that's a, so that's a disconnect there. There's a disconnect with the youth, but there's a disconnect with us. You know, um, so I'm just saying that to say that the connectivity that we need, the uh, continuity of struggle, has to be what connects us all. The struggle. So I'm saying that the struggle of the Black Panther Party is a continuation of Malcolm and what he meant. I see Davis, who was an actor. I mean, he supported activism. Ruby D. He said Malcolm was our man though. Mm -hmm. And and at first glance, you're like, what well, our man? What do we mean? Malcolm was our man though. But look at the beauty. That's that saying is is fifty something years old. And it's so true. Malcolm was our man though. McGarvey was our manhood. Martin Delaney was our manhood. Henry Holland Garnett was our manhood. So you ain't invent manhood. Nobody here can say, well, I, I, I'm a man. I'm not afraid of the white man. I'm a man. Well, you know, you come in a long line of that. So that connection is what we need because if you know you're standing on shoulders, then you know you have people around you to stand with you. Yes, Brother Brian. Would you say that... <clears throat> Donald Trump is the perfect idol or example that conservatives of America love as a president? Yes. He's, he's a necessary evil for he, them. You know, you have to remember, <coughs> he was able to win. This was an election that most people thought the Bushes would win. Uh, he appealed to, you know, let, let me give you an example so you get it. Um, uh, you remember the Alabama governor that stood in front of uh, yes. University yes. of Georgia? Well, that was um, Wallace. 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 What was his whole name? Yeah. George Wallace. George, George Wallace. Wallace. When George Wallace first ran for office, George Wallace was beaten by um, somebody that's in obscurity in terms of history to this day. He got beat because the person he ran against said something to the effect well, if you put me in office, I'll put them in place. And he said, well, when you put, them, when you put me in office, they won't even have a place. But then the person said, well, if you put me in office, I'll put my foot on their throats. He lost that election, his first election. You know what George Wallace said? I got out nigger and said I will never be out nigger again. In other words, if you stab somebody, in the stomach, I'll stab him in the head. And so he spent his whole life uh, engaged in upmanship. 
I'm, a, I'm up the stakes, no matter what you say. It never lost after that. So I'm saying that to say that Trump out Trump them, or as Wallace would say, he out niggered them <laughs> by with the things he was saying. He said Mexicans are nothing but rapists and drug dealers, blacks are criminals. He uh he just what went down the whole gamut of panoply of things that people were doing. And these were things that nobody ever heard during an election. I mean, I mean, for him to tell a woman that's asking a question, look, shut up. I'm not talking to you now. Go to the next one. That dismissive, that empowered some white men. He just because like they said, they said just he said like no joke. He just yeah. like they it. said he's serious. And he was able to beat what 18, 19 other guys that were all elected officials. He beat the stuff out of them. Now, any of them that would have got in would have done the things that, you know, these corporations wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. So he's doing their, their, their bidding, and he's at the same time living the life of a president, which, which they don't care about. Although, whatever indiscretions he's doing, long as he does their will, you know, Kennedy said he was going to break up the CIA, as he said, shatter it into a thousand pieces. He said he was going to uh, re-look at this whole economic system, you know, that bill that he put out about the Federal Reserve. He was going to make some changes that were shocking, and he had to go. So I'm just saying that Trump, uh, as long as he has, as long as he parades himself as the father of white supremacy, uh, he's going to be in the running. And I, I don't know if he's going to win. But he's on firm ground with his white supremacist thing. He's a close Yeah, but he's significantly, he's not, he's not far removed from Reagan, he's not far removed from Nixon and all these other guys. Can I say one thing? Because, you know, people people keep saying segregation. Hold on, brother, hold on, brother. Let him go, let him go. No, I'm saying, yeah, he, he's more he's more like uh, dangerous with his mouth. Than Nixon he or, is. or, or uh, he is. Bush. He is. He, 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 and he's saying what he's no, saying. Right. Or oh, they love him, man. The things he's saying, they just Ver he verbalizes things that he does not sound good. He calls it. No, you're right. right out of his mouth. You're right. But in terms of substance. Now, the symbolism, he's a really, really bad guy. In terms of substance, how far removed is he from Bush 43, Bush 41, uh, Reagan? But hold on, we, you know away. what? We keep thinking, we keep thinking segregation hold on, brother. Hold and all on, that. Hold on, brother. What? Go ahead. That's another thing that has to stop. That white supremacy stuff. What do you okay. mean? Let me think about it. Stop it. Hold on. Hold on. Let me say one thing. Question. Hold on, brother. That white supremacy bullcrap needs to stop. What do you mean? They what? made mean that up. That? Or did we make that up? Oh. Then who made that up? Was it that race or was it our race? Well, obviously, we didn't make it up. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, right the only supreme, the okay. supremacy I see on the planet, the the original is us. Now, why they call they something okay, that so I don't gonna, know why. Well, Look, we, well, have we don't have, we we have to stop playing of, into uh, their book of definitions, but That's the facts I mean. are that condition exists. They are powerful white men on this planet. Doesn't matter. That they believe all, right. all they major what decisions. They are. Hold on a second. I'm just saying. They, they believe all major decisions will be made by them. They will the control. The genetic decision. Okay. Put it that way. Okay. 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 Let me just ask you a question, Sid. And then you can go for it. Uh, who controls the military? I don't care. Of course, it's the government. You, you don't care? We know who it is. Does it make it right? Okay, hold on. It, it we not right? we not we not get into the moral well, stuff. Who about. controls the I'm army, air force? No, sis. You, you saying that is in other words, you acting like white supremacy doesn't exist. But if I say because who controls, they made hold on, sis. If you say who controls the army, the white man, the navy, the white man, that doesn't mean air force, the white man, the marine, the, the white man, they CIA, the that. white man, NSA, the white man, FBI, the white man, ASS. Five, the, right. five, five, right. the Fortune 500 companies, the white man. They took and we're going to say that it don't exist? They Are you kidding? And Who controls all the major police departments throughout, throughout the 50 it's states? Not Who controls? Well, what, what, well, you can say that all you want. Right. I'll tell you one thing. 
in South Africa, in South Africa, you can go, you can go out to work or go out into the field, and your family will never see you again. That ain't no, that ain't no talk. That's white supremacy, and the same thing exists here. That ain't talk. So you can say you don't care and say, well, why I'm tired of white supremacy crap. It ain't crap. It's a reality. We're the ones who's in charge. I know a couple of other things. Sis, okay, brother. Yes, brother. Go ahead, brother. Don't get what I'm saying. Everybody keeps thinking segregation and all that shit come from the South. Okay. Donald Trump is a product of the North. That we we live more segregated than the South ever did. Okay. Right up here in the North. No, I'm with that. Yes, sir, brother. It's just an observation that the supremacy that we're talking about, you may know you have a high degree of intellect, your spirituality is in the right place and everything. And that makes you on a higher level than somebody else who says they're supreme. But we talk, what he's talking about is a physical dominance and using all your resources to control other people. That's what the majority of white people who have power are doing. And we can't deny that that's what's happening. That's okay. When they came to this country and they made a segue in by pretending to be friends to certain people. That's right. And then after they got the dominance to force them off their land, that's the way they perpetrated their white supremacy. And guess what? That's what and here's what, brother. If, if let's our own life. devices, we if we life. control just the middle world in Africa, is it safe to say that we'd be different? Yes, absolutely. Things would be totally different? Yes, absolutely. No, but we don't control that. Well, do we? Don't. No one gives up control. Well, it's not so much Chinese. The white power is not giving up. The Chinese are making it in roads, but I'm just saying the fact is if we control just the natural resources alone puts us in a powerful position. We would be um, an emergent people like you. You you couldn't believe. Power is not giving up because it's the world be taken. needs the diamond and gold. Okay. Well, need the minerals that well, Africa has. Well. So I'm just saying, if we can control it, if it was that easy to say everything in the ground we control. So there is such a thing as white supremacy. There is such a thing as global um, um, powers. Yes. Because if it didn't exist, then we would control it. But we don't control it because when all is said and done, I don't care what you talk about. I don't care what you legislate. When that man put a gun in your face, it's on global. Right. All the BS walks out the window. That's you right. can say, which Dr. Clark always said, Pan-Africanism or Paris. I believe that. But the bottom line, are you going to die for it? Because if you're not going to die for it, the white man has already demonstrated he's willing to die to be in charge. Oh, exactly. And if you don't think so, he is. He is. look no further than the Civil War. They said then, okay, 620,000 white men died fighting each other over the Civil War. Look at it. That's commitment. When you gonna fight for power and control and fight your own. Now, yes, there did come a time when two hundred thousand black friendly fire uh, came in. They ain't one nothing friendly about it. Two hundred thousand black men came in. Two hundred thousand strong, right? And for we freed ourselves. The most important war ever was the Civil War. That's a conversation for another day. But we freed ourselves. 200,000 strong freed ourselves. They had to um, implement the 13th Amendment after that because the brothers were going to fight anyway. 20 years prior to that, at that meeting in, in, um, in, um, in Buffalo, when the black men decided they was going to take 50,000 men and go into the Deep South and take the war. And this was in the 1840s. They were going to do that. They, had, they came to a vote. It was only Frederick Douglass, one of the last speakers, that got up there and railed against it. So we've had those times. But yes, sister, we, 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 we wind question? it down. Go ahead. Is, okay, I'm listening to all of this. You're very educated. I'm, yeah, I appreciate the knowledge. Good. What is the strategy? It has to be some kind of strategy for every speaker that comes here to bring young people into these rooms. 
going to be us. And that's why when young people act out, who do they act out on? Us. When we get on buses and trains now, and we hear them calling each other niggas, and you bitch, you hoe, you bitch ass nigga, and all that stuff, people get quiet. They don't say anything. I'm saying you got to correct that thing. can you admit that a lot of young people, a lot of young people are very disillusioned with the hypocrisy because I have raised five. My youngest is 31. And when they were young, I brought them out to Pan Africa, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, all of that. Then they should be ready. They They should be ready. With your leadership and the things that they're teaching, they should be ready. All right. They're interested. No, but let her finish. No, let her finish. What I'm saying is, the few that are still committed, the young people that have been taught, and they see, even though they've been disillusioned. What did your young ones, uh, what did they do with that knowledge, that great knowledge of the Nile Valley that Dr. Ben gave us, or the overall history of of Africa and African Americans that Dr. Clark gave? What did they do with it? They're educators. Okay. They're educators, they're independent business people. Good. And at the same time, I say the majority of the people that they admire growing up in the Pan Africanist movement, yes. they see the hypocrisy. What hypocrisy? You talk about on the individual level. Well, individuals are going to be there. But I'm just saying that's organizationally, why, we got to stay you, true. That's why I say, ask you now, this generation. But, but, but you answered your own question. You said they got that distinct truth from, yeah, but I'm just saying they got that truth that Dr. Ben and all others dedicated themselves to. We need more of it, not less of it. We need more of it, not less of it. And if you get the right example, why would you even bother work worrying about somebody that's fake that ain't real, as, as, as you said, the ones who weren't real? Deal with reality. That's not the question. I am Mama Kosua. I'm an example in my community. Mm-hmm. I pass young people all the time that their parents didn't pass. So what's your real question? Sis? The question is, how can we encourage young people Get them in to come room. out? That's what I ask you. How can we Because you, as you, okay, you, okay, and that's a good question, and that's fair. That's extremely that's fair. The thing is, uh, and, and, I, and I understand your question better now, okay. and I appreciate okay. that. I would just say, tell them wherever they are, they can enhance their position better with information. It is better to be informed than not informed. You don't want our people going out here uninformed because if you're uninformed, your friend is your enemy and your enemy is your friend. And we have people that taught us to look at things the right way, the proper way. So it's better to be informed than not informed. So it's better for them to be in here and engage in discussion than not be here. So I appreciate the question. And that was a good question. Once I finally got what you was really saying. And I appreciate that. So at this point, Ray, we're going to stop. If if all minds are clear, we'll stop at this point. Oh, no. See you next year. I'll bring more information next time in two weeks. We're trying to have a bigger Black Solidarity Day with organizations. I spoke to Dr. Lewis and hopefully like the Mackey Group, the UAM, the UNIA, December 12th, and all the organizations can get to doing something collaborative. Yeah, well, that's a very important Black Solid every day. Now that's a year from now because it's the first Monday in November. Right? We're literally still in that first week, so you talk about something a year from now. Yeah, we're meeting monthly okay. to make sure we're on the track. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. fantastic. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever said is just dialogue, and you gotta remember, we only scratching the surface. Circumstances will wake people up. We might hang separately, but we will hang. We'll be here in two weeks. Come on with something different. I like that. Dr. Arthur Lewis will be the keynote, and he will continue with the economics of Africa. In America, in two weeks, give Brother Mike a great big hand. Give yourself a great big hand. Uh,
somebody? And Doc, you want to say something? And Doc wants to say something? Just to emphasize, because I'm learning from all the comments, the brother Gray and everything. The African, take you one minute, the African, 55 countries in Africa, we went through this before, but we will continue. You're struggling here as an African people, they're struggling there. We're the most populous people on the face of the earth. And the comment I want to make about the unity, whether it's with the community, we're getting there. The African Union was fit of 55 countries formulated the African Transcontinental Free Trade Zone, the largest free trade zone in the world. And the African proclaimed to the world that we Africans are the most unified people on this earth, more than anybody else exemplified by the, the, the African transcontinental free trade zone, which we spoke about. And they specifically pointed to Europe. They say while Europe is breaking up, Africa is unified, that there are no more, you, there are no more organized people than us Africans. And we're part of that. So what I'm trying to say is as we all talk and help each other, there's a bigger picture. And uh, we are the most unified people here, and internationally, or we wouldn't have lasted this long. So let's look, we're going to look at a, a stronger perspective. But he's telling you, you already got it. But we want to show each other that we have it. Okay? <laughs>